Good morning. This is week three of the survey of the British art and uh, today I'd like to talk with you about the Tudors. And everybody seems to know something about the Tudors. This was such an uh, interesting um, period in British history and uh, uh, so many uh, important uh, figures um, and so much inspiration for the uh, for the later periods. Um, so uh, generally, we are entering the uh, the period in British history of art and general culture that uh, is named after the dynasty who sat on the throne of England uh, after the Wars of the Roses ended. Uh, so the um, medieval monarchy mostly with the Plantagenets um, uh, descending from the Normans earlier on, um, killed each other off and the last surviving um, king uh, from the York dynasty, Richard III, was uh, killed in battle uh, at the Battle of Bosworth and the new dynasty, the Tudors, came to the throne uh, a lot starts to change. So with the new dynasty uh, we have uh, almost immediately we have some new intellectual ideas, new elites. Well, most of the aristocracy were dead anyway uh, or in disgrace. Um, so Henry Tudor became Henry VII. He married the um, princess from the York dynasty and so they started the new uh, the new dynasty. Uh, before we start looking at the art from the Tudor period, um, uh, perhaps it's a good idea to look at some uh, later paintings that were inspired by, uh, by the Tudors, by the court of uh, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and uh, you all see, well probably all, uh, you all now have uh, some ideas of what aspects of uh, Tudor uh, world and uh, life might be inspirational for, for later uh, generations of artists, especially in the 19th century. These are uh, going to be a few uh, 19th century paintings. So the first one is from one of the Pre-Raphaelites, so we are going to meet this man um, in a much uh, larger extent later on, John Everett Miller, The Boyhood of Raleigh, so the beginning of um, of uh, geographical um, exploration, the beginning even of the growth of the uh, of the empire uh, that would later become the um, the huge and powerful British Empire in the times of uh, of Miller, so in the nineteenth century, and here we have. Uh, uh, this uh, little charming scene when uh, Walter Raleigh, one of the great uh, uh, heroes of the uh, of the period, the great uh, seafaring adventurers, uh, is but a young boy and he is listening very attentively to some adventure story, probably of an older sailor. Uh, pointing towards the sea, probably telling this boy about the uh, adventures and uh, riches that await him there. So we have this wide-eyed child who will become one of the heroes of the Tudor period. But otherwise, uh, most of the inspiration and most of the aspects of, uh, of um, culture that the Tudors are remembered for are connected with the royal court. So we have this great towering figure of Henry VIII and you are going to see quite a lot of him today. Uh, so the first version comes from the late 19th century um, academic um, artist uh, called Marcus Stone. And the title of this painting is Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn observed by Queen Catherine. Queen Catherine of Aragon, of course. Because it's not only about Henry, it's mostly about his wives. The wives really make the history here. Henry is just a, 
um, big towering frightening uh, figure of the monarch and we have all these women around him some of them becoming his wife more, even more becoming his mistresses and here we have a story illustrating um, a very famous episode so the first wife Catherine of Aragon the Spanish princess um, walking uh, past the chamber sees uh, Henry VIII in some sort of private conversation, although probably nothing intimate because there are lots of people in the room, including Cardinal Wolsey, as you can see, this figure in the red that we're going to meet today as well, uh, with uh, one of her ladies, Anne Boleyn. So eventually, as we all know, Henry will divorce Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn and uh, break with the Church of Rome and establish the new religion, the Church of England, only to have uh, Anne Boleyn beheaded on some trumped up charges a few years later. So what we have is the king uh, in, his, in his very characteristic pose. So he's not wearing the crown, he is wearing this kind of tunic with very tight leggings showing off his um, muscular calves. He was apparently very proud of his legs and he was quite athletic in his youth, although uh, later on, after a very serious um, accident when he fell off the horse, uh, he um, started gaining weight and here we have him uh, as quite an obese uh, man. Uh, but still assuming this very proud pose. Where do we know this pose from? Of course, from the paintings, and you are going to see the original paintings in a little uh, in a little moment. So we have those stories of the court of Henry, uh, all the um, problems with his wives, and uh, you are going to see some portraits of them uh, in a little while as well. So six wives of Henry VIII, that's something that everybody remembers. Another uh, 19th century um, image shows uh, Sir Thomas More's farewell to his daughter. So once again we have a woman here as a focus of attention, but uh, she is not one of uh, Henry's mistresses or wives. She is the daughter of the Lord Chancellor, one of the greatest politicians of Henry's court, Sir Thomas More. Uh, and uh, this moment shows the politician stripped of the royal favour uh, and uh, being led to the place of beheading. So that's why he says farewell. So we have this uh, older man looking very dignified, uh, wearing a rather characteristic cap and uh, you might ask yourself, have I seen this man before? And if yes, then where? Of course, in the paintings. Uh, and we have a young, visibly distraught woman uh, who's supposed to be his um, daughter. Uh, apparently they had a very warm and loving relationship. So uh, this is a touching scene of a young daughter bidding farewell to her father a great statesman, uh, the man who would eventually become a Catholic saint for opposing uh, the, uh, the Reformation started by Henry VIII and for losing his life because of that. So a rather, I would say, tear-jerking, sensationalist story. The next one is also tear-jerking uh, and sensationalist. This is by a French painter, Paul de la, de la Roche, also in the 19th century, but it's uh, um, exhibited in the National Gallery in London. So if you ever go there, go and see this very large painting, The Execution of Lady Jane Grey. And we have another young woman, but about to be beheaded herself. If you know a little bit more about Tudor history, she was the shortest reigning Queen of England ever, just nine days after the death of Henry VIII and his son Edward. She was the one nominated by, um, by Edward um, uh, VI 
uh, to become the next Queen of England because she was a relative, not a very close one, but a cousin and she was a Protestant. Uh, and uh, two sisters of Edward marry the older sister by Queen Catherine of, uh, of Aragon, uh, was a Catholic, a very devout Catholic, and Elizabeth by Anne Boleyn was uh, declared illegitimate when her mother was beheaded. So here we have this beautiful, virginal uh, young woman dressed in white being led very gently uh, by a courtier uh, so she can reach out towards the executioner's block and we have the executioner himself looking very sad but he has to do his duty of course on the, uh, on the orders of the next queen, Queen Mary, the Bloody Mary, Mary Tudor uh, and two ladies of the court, the attendants of the young uh, short-lived queen who are very distraught and especially the lady who is uh, more visible with her uh, with her face uh, illuminated by a ray of light she's also wearing some very characteristic dress and uh, especially the headdress the so-called um, gable bonnet or gable uh, headdress and how do we know this headdress of course from the paintings and you will see these paintings today. The last one from the uh, set of 19th century uh, paintings inspired by the Tudors comes uh, from another academic artist, Augustus Leopold Egg. Um, no first-class painter but quite well-established artist in the mid-Victorian period and refers to the court of Elizabeth I. The title is Queen Elizabeth discovers she is no longer young. This is a Victorian painter doing that. Uh, they have a new queen on the throne, Queen Victoria, but she's very young still. And she's a moral woman uh, with a husband and a growing family that would eventually reach nine children. Elizabeth, very famously, decided not to marry, to become the virgin queen. Uh, but uh, at least according to some of her descendants in the Victorian period, she always regretted that. She always uh, was vain and uh, she flirted with all those courtiers and foreign dignitaries and one of the worst moments of her life was when she came to a conclusion she was no longer young and beautiful. And this is what the Victorians have to say about one of the most powerful and uh, intellectually brilliant women ever to sit on the, on the English throne. So it tells you something, perhaps about the Queen in her later life, about the fashions of the court, about perhaps a bit of furniture and daily life, but it tells you a lot about the Victorians, what they expected of a woman even if this woman was a queen. So this is the introduction. We could probably have many, many more examples of works inspired by the Tudors. But let us now look at the Tudors themselves. So let's start with, uh, with architecture. And let's start with uh, the moment when the Renaissance comes from Italy to England. And uh, I usually uh, recommend some documentaries and this time I would like to, uh, to um, uh, recommend two documentaries. One is uh, uh, called uh, The Very English Renaissance in three parts. It will talk about uh, the, the Tudors and also about the Stuarts. So uh, if you want to watch it, it's a good idea because it will cover two weeks this week and the next. Uh, another documentary which is very interesting and which will tell you in greater detail and show you all the close-ups is The Eye of the Tudors. This is a documentary about Hans Holbein and this is the major artist that we are going to encounter today. So um, The Eye of the Tudors and the Very English Renaissance. And so the the period of the um, 
Renaissance in Britain is really dominated by foreign artists. Uh, Britain was in, well, England, it's not yet united, it will be united under the Stuarts. So England uh, has just emerged from a very bloody civil war with a new dynasty on the throne uh, who do not feel particularly comfortable on the throne because, uh, as you may or may not know, they were all descended from illegitimate children um, born by the widow of King Henry V, a, Spanish, uh, um, a French uh, queen, uh, who retired to Wales and uh, she had an affair with one of her courtiers called Owen Tudor. When babies started coming, they finally married, but only to kind of legitimize the children who are already there. And uh, the whole Tudor dynasty started from this liaison. So there was very little connection to previous monarchs of, um, of uh, England by blood, only by marriage through, uh, through this French uh, queen. And uh, the other side of the, of the family, they were gentry, but not really a uh, great nobility. And it all started with an illegitimate fling. Uh, so you might imagine that the Tudors, um, a few generations later of course, uh, when Henry VII takes the throne and Henry VIII continues and then the children of Henry VIII, uh, they would really want to legitimize their position on the throne. For example, by sponsoring wonderful modern art. For them, this is the most modern art you can think about. So, uh, one of the first things that uh, uh, that was done was to uh, to invite a Spanish, a Spanish, a, an Italian um, sculptor called Pietro Torrigiano. If you watch the documentary, The Very English Renaissance, you will know that he had to flee from Italy because he smashed the face of, Mich of Michelangelo. So he was involved in the fight and uh, this is how Michelangelo got his very famously broken nose. So Pietro d'Ortorigiano was commissioned to um, provide the sculptures for the uh, tomb of King Henry VII and Queen Elizabeth of York, the parents of Henry VIII. This um, funerary chapel was um, added to, uh, to Westminster Abbey and uh, the architecture of the chapel was still in the Gothic style but uh, the effigies, the sculptures on the tomb itself really display the new ideas, the ideas of the Enlightenment, the ideas of humanism. We have very um, lifelike images of uh, the king and the queen. We have lots of uh, additional um, images of uh, um, human figures uh, representing all kinds of uh, virtues and uh, allegories. And this is really the first such thing, the first such work of art that would really open the floodgates for the Renaissance and for the foreign artists. Uh, if we look at the um, architecture, so the, the most important example, something that you can still visit, and I hope you will soon enough, because it's a wonderful place, it's Hampton Court Palace. We have the palace uh, built for Cardinal Wolsey, so this Archbishop of Canterbury, the leader of the church, the Catholic Church, of course, uh, during the early reign of Henry VIII, in the most fashionable new style, uh, including the use of the most fashionable new material, that is red brick. We will see Hampton Court a few times because then, later on, some 
extra space, extra wings were added by the, um, by the Stuarts and by the Hanoverians in the 17th and 18th century. We are now in the 16th century and this is the oldest remaining part with the uh, great gatehouse and the entrance gate to one of the many uh, many courtyards, uh, also the kitchens come from this period and if you look at uh, the surviving elements of the original palace, you can see the red brick, you can see uh, those towers and it looks like it's kind of a castle almost, but you start having new elements like this great um, clock uh, above the, uh, the gateway called Anne Boleyn's Gate and also those round decorations, round ceramic decorations on the same gate uh, which uh, came from Italy and which were in the new Renaissance style. Uh, so, of course, the red brick took on, everybody wanted to have a red brick palace and here we have an example uh, Blickling Hall in Norfolk from the early 16th century. This happens to be the family home, the childhood home of Queen Anne Boleyn herself. So uh, you would have all those new elites, the up and coming families who were um, given a lot of lands and privileges by the Tudors, uh, building new residences which were not um, supposed to be defensive castles, but rather pleasant palaces with large windows, uh, with um, big gardens, uh, and many of them, most of them were made in the red brick, if you could afford that. This was a new wonderful thing. Uh, so uh, here we come to the reign of Henry VIII, and um, I already mentioned that he was a very glamorous young man. He was uh, tall and athletic, a very good horseman. Uh, he loved all kinds of horse sports, jousting for example. This was the reason of this uh, accident I mentioned um, earlier. Uh, he was uh, very bright. He actually was the younger son of the king, but the older son, his brother um, Arthur, died young, leaving a young widow, Catherine of Aragon, whom Henry married very quickly to keep the, um, the alliance with Spain. And uh, then he started to reform the country as a Renaissance absolutist monarch. So, um, one of the first things he did was to have a big meeting with the King of France. So everybody, all the court would go to France and they would meet uh, at a specially constructed uh, temporary place, like temporary buildings and tents called the Field of the Cloth of Gold. The Cloth of Gold was like the fabric with real gold woven in and this was used uh, not only for the uh, clothes of the king and uh, his attendants but even for the tents in which they stayed. So here we have um, an anonymous painting showing the procession. Uh, you can see a uh, young King Henry VIII on horseback, on this white horse in the, uh, in the uh, forefront of the, of the painting. Uh, coming to meet the King of France at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. So very glamorous display of the power and wealth and uh, importance of England. Uh, you may be surprised by the dragon flying above uh, the uh, retinue of Henry VIII. Uh, the dragon is the dragon which is a symbol of Wales. So. Henry was quite proud of his Welsh uh, origin and uh, I, he probably uh, asked for this uh, heraldic emblem of Wales to be included in the, uh, in the painting. However, the way that we remember Henry VIII nowadays is mostly thanks to one man alone, 
Hans Holbein the Younger. Uh, the great painter uh, from the German-speaking countries. We cannot talk of Germany really before the, the unification, but he spoke German. He lived in uh, German-speaking countries and in Switzerland, the German-speaking part of Switzerland. Uh, he was a son of a painter, that's why he's called Hans Holbein the Younger. His father was also the painter. And uh, um, in his youth he was mostly doing um, religious works, but then he started to specialise in the portraits. And uh, before we meet the family of King Henry VIII, let's meet some of the other people from the court. Uh, especially the person who invited Holbein to the court, Sir Thomas More. You've seen him already saying goodbye to his daughter. Here we have the portrait, the real portrait, that even inspired the Victorian one. So we have um, uh, Thomas More, Lord Chancellor. It's like the Prime Minister, the most important figure in the country. Uh, dressed in splendid garments, uh, Holbein had a wonderful talent for showing all kinds of textures of velvet and fur and gold and uh, all kinds of um, fabrics and also human skin and human likeness. So here we have a very lifelike portrait of Sir Thomas More with perhaps even some attempt at psychologizing. So we see him as a serious man probably thinking about the good of England. Uh, Another portrait from this period showing another courtier is uh, Thomas Cromwell. He was um, like the Minister of Finance and he was a man from the low social background. I guess his father was a butcher or something. Uh, so he was a very ambitious young man from poor origins uh, uh, and uh, if you compare his portrait with Moore's portrait. You can probably say that Holbein didn't like him so much. He made him into this kind of very stern, uh, perhaps greedy even, uh, man uh, enjoying the power that he, uh, that he um, was able to grasp in spite of his low status. So uh, we continue in a moment.